Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. Today we're talking with Alberto Ibarguen for MPF's Masterclass Series. The National Press Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to helping journalists cover complex topics with depth and accuracy. Our mission includes journalists around the U.S. and around the world. I'm Sandy Johnson, president of the National Press Foundation. With me today is Alberto Ibarguen, president of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Alberto is a winner of MPF's Kiplinger Award for Distinguished Contributions to Journalism. Alberto, congratulations. Thank you. This award must prompt you to think back on your long career. What was your first job in journalism? I know you didn't, you came through it at, through a rather non-traditional path. I, I, my first job in journalism was actually being editor of the paper in college, being editor of the Wesleyan Argus. And it was uh, time, time consuming enough that it really does qualify as even more than a part-time job. It was a phenomenal experience to be in charge of a newsroom uh, and I, it never left me. And from there you moved into the law briefly? From there I was, I was in the Peace Corps for five years. I went to law school. I was a legal aid lawyer. I became lawyer for a bank because I just was curious about too many different things. Um, and then ultimately I kept on coming back and back to uh, the impact of the, the newspaper on, on my community and got involved with the folks at the Hartford Current and David Laventhal. Um, and Mike Davies hired me to go work at the Hartford Current. So my first job there was actually as the, in, in the administration of the, of the Hartford Current. Mm -hmm. uh, very few journalists have law degrees. Has that come in handy over the years? It's been, it's been tremendous. Mm -hmm. First of all, it was one of the reasons they asked me to join the Hartford Current in the first place. Uh, but it was useful for vetting stories. It's useful for knowing knowing instinctively that the law is a shield, uh, but it's also a weapon. Um, and so my review of, of uh, stories was always, how do we get the story in the paper? The story is, is true, how do we get it in the paper? Not how do we keep it out? And if somebody came around and threatened to sue, I could take the attitude that I'm just not going to be scared. I've been sued by better people than you with an actual case, and I still won. Uh, <laughs> so I think it was, um, I don't want to be facetious about it, but it was really, it was uh, tremendously uh, uh, valuable, as was, frankly, business experience um, outside of the newspaper business, because I didn't have a lot of built-in assumptions about how the business is supposed to run. Mm -hmm. During your tenure at the Miami Herald, the paper won three Pulitzers. Could you tell us about those? One was, one was sure, one mm -hmm. with pride. One was um, uh, coverage uh, of a botched election, which was ultimately overturned by the courts. Another was um, actually a, a prize to Leonard Pitts for commentary. He was a terrific uh, commentator. And the third, uh, the one that I think probably got the most attention, was for our coverage uh, of the uh, spot, spot News uh, when the INS um, came into Miami and took the boy, uh, Elian Gonzalez, and returned him to his father. And that particular story, I think, uh, really does deserve a lot of attention. That was a phenomenal effort by our newsroom, which was led then by, by Marty Barron, who's now at the Washington Post. It, it was a difficult task to tell the hottest story going in the, in the coolest, most responsible way. But it was really the only way to cover it. It was so hot that any attempt at hyperbole, any attempt at exaggeration, any attempt at coloring the story would, would have been gilding the lily. All you had to do was keep your cool and tell the story straight, and did we ever. It was a phenomenal job, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, tell us a little bit about the impact of the um, Cuban-American community on that story. Um, did it affect your coverage at all? I know it's, there, it's a very involved community, very influential. Sure, and, mm -hmm. it's a, and, it was, and it was, I think, more then than now, 
uh, it was a particularly complicated uh, complicated relationship. The the um, the the underlying um, story is one of exile, not of immigration in the Cuban Cuban American community. And so, for years, what uh, what the Herald had attempted to do was to translate a mainstream center left point of view to a group of people that were basically not U.S. mainstream, uh, not center left. In fact, of anything, I'd say center right. And um, <coughs> and I think there was a there was a uh, there was a, a chasm between uh, between the two. Uh, my first job there was as the publisher of the Spanish paper, and one of the things I insisted on doing almost from the start was separating the two papers um, th and, and making El Nuevo Herald, the Spanish paper, be a, um, uh, we, did not have, uh, we did not have editorials, but we had plenty of op-eds, mm -hmm. and we had a different point of view about the news. We had a different sense of what was, uh, what belonged on the front page. It wasn't necessarily U.S. news. You'd be much more likely to find um, Venezuela or Colombia or the news from Cuba uh, on those pages than you were to find whatever happened in New York or Los Angeles or even Washington. So, uh, so there, was a, there was a separation um, already. When this comes about, the whole community was was really divided in opinion, um, and there it was it was an extremely tense uh, situation. Families didn't talk to each other uh, when you had different. Uh, it, it became everything about it felt emotional, and so it was really important uh, to me as the publisher by then of both uh, the. Spanish paper and the uh, English paper, the, the Nuevo Herald and the Miami Herald, that they be true to their different missions. The El Nuevo Herald was meant to be a voice of the community, and there were no house editorials in that paper. The Miami Herald was meant to be a mainstream U.S. newspaper, and there you were meant to tell the story exactly as you, as much as you could, the full, accurate, contextual search for truth, um, as much as you hum humanly could. And I think we did a great job in both. I think one of, the, one of my best and probably most schizophrenic days was the, the, the day after the raid, uh, the Miami Herald published, we actually stopped the presses that night, or that morning, we were running the Bulldog edition in order to get the great Al Diaz photograph of the soldier with the goggles and so forth. Um, and the Herald ran uh, the Elian Gonzalez story told quite professionally. And El Nuevo Herald ran a look what they've done to us uh, front page. And, uh, and they each spoke in perfect pitch to the community they were writing for. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that pre-dawn raid and the aftermath, the chaos of the newsroom and trying to put that, that um, bulldog um, edition together. The, the, the newsroom actually was not chaotic. I think almost everything else in Miami was chaotic <laughs> that day, but I don't think the newsroom was. I actually first, I, I'm the one who sounded the alarm because my son was the overnight guy at the Associated Press. Diego was, had the various monitors. He had the live feed from CNN and whoever else was was uh, was broadcast was uh, narrow casting it, I guess. And um, he saw what was happening, put out the uh, the whatever bells alarm at the Associated Press, um, alerted the members, and then called his father, called me at five ten, maybe five fifteen in the morning. And I wake up and I say, hello, and he says, pop, they took the kid, get on the stick, and hangs up. <laughs> um, I, I, then, I then immediately start calling uh, the editors, and then I thought, well, I, let's stop the press, because we're running the Bulldog. We, the, the Bulldog would run Saturday morning for distribution, Saturday late morning and afternoon. And... Um, and so we, I knew that there had to be some great art coming from this. So, called down, stopped the presses, 
and just said, wait, let's see what happens. And then I called, then distrib the distribution was alerted and also called the marketing guys because I figured if by somewhere around 8.30, 9 o'clock, when I was sure we'd have something uh, ready to go out, um, I knew the television would be desperate for uh, for additional material, for props, and they would be able, and they did, we hand-delivered copies of the Miami Herald to all the TV stations, and all of them were able to hold up copies of the great Al Diaz photograph, for which he won a Pulitzer Prize, too. A great branding moment. <laughs> it really was. It really was. Uh, I know you had another uh, Stop the Presses moment during the uh, 2000 election. Can you tell us about that? That was a really different kind of, uh, that was a different kind of chaos, I guess. Uh, that was the, uh, the night of the Bush-Gore election, and it was undecided. I was actually in San Jose. Marty, uh, Marty Barron was in, in Miami. We were in constant communication trying to figure out how long can we go? How long can we hold? And finally, we couldn't hold it anymore. It looked like Bush was was the winner. Several state, several organizations had called it for, uh, for uh, for Bush, and so we went with a Bush wins. Uh, I don't remember what the headline was, but we went with a Bush wins headline, and it couldn't have been 15 minutes later. Uh, the Associated Press said, "Not so fast," <laughs> and we immediately had to stop. Uh, stop the presses and um, and not distribute any of the uh, of the. I don't remember how many thousand papers we actually um, we actually uh, published. I do remember though that they later became available on eBay. Uh, of course, <laughs> as as, uh, as uh, Dewey beats Truman kind of uh, mementos. And I mm -hmm. suppose. If Gore had won, um, they really would have been valuable. Mm -hmm. But um, but in any event, we finally ended up um, uh, publishing a uh, too close to call kind of headline. Mm -hmm. What we did do though is in, on the when the Supreme Court some months later, uh, I guess a month or so later, five mm, weeks, uh, five <laughs> weeks was it? Yeah, uh, finally made the decision. I remember it was a Saturday. Mm -hmm. On Monday morning because of the Florida Public Records Law, and uh, you asked if it helps to be a lawyer, you're, you're focused in on this sort of thing. We had prepared a subpoena for every single election post in Florida demanding to see the public record, which is the ballots. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the government wasn't gonna count the votes, we would count the votes, and we did. We hired. Um, we hired BDO Seedman, the accounting firm. We actually first went to the big four, and none of the big four accounting firms would take the case. <laughs> you can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> BDO Seedman's chairman, was, was I'm, I was told, said, well, it would be fun to be a footnote to history. So they actually counted the votes, and according to their count um, of, the, of the actual uh, ballots, it was just as slim a margin, but it was a but it was a Bush uh, victory, and the rest is history. And the rest is history, <laughs> right? Um, the Miami Herald zigged when the rest of the media zagged on the um, whether the Bush administration had made the case for war against Iraq. Can you uh, tell us more about that? Uh, it really wasn't that hard a decision. We trusted our reporting, and the Washington bureau of the of the Miami Herald uh, turns out to have gotten it right. Uh, there, there were no weapons of mass destruction, and that was the, the that was the belief of, the, or that was the reporting, and the finding of our reporters. It was, it's really not that hard when you've got people like John Wallman and Clark Hoyt running your bureau. Um, you're pretty sure that this is going to be solid reporting. I confess that we did reluctantly give in when Colin Powell made his uh, his. Uh, speech at the, um, at the, at the United Nations. Um, and at that point, we were really, we were very reluctant. Uh, we reluctantly accepted um, the, uh, the position of the administration. But right up to that point, we were completely skeptical based solely on the reporting. The other thing is a number of people didn't publish that work. We published everything because our editors double checking, double, you know, cold reading what was developed in Washington, found it solid journalism. And it turns out it was great journalism. Great. 
Um, let's segue, segue to your work at the Knight Foundation. Uh, what was the aha moment when you realized that the Knight Foundation could actively make a difference in helping journalism survive? There really were two. One was when I looked around and I thought, if all we're doing is teaching the best people in the best universities, the best journalism schools, best practices for a world we don't understand, then maybe we're doing something wrong. And so I proposed to my colleagues, Eric Newton and Gary Kevill, that we should have a contest, the first, the first element of which is to admit that Knight Foundation, the great journalism foundation, doesn't know what we're doing. Um, and on the, on the belief that sometimes it's true, the truth shall set you free. So by not, by, by accepting that we didn't know and saying we're going to ask you, we're going to, we're going to fund ideas to use digital platforms to deliver news and information to geographically defined communities. And in that first, in that first round, I think we got something like 3,000 ideas. Um, so that, that was the part two of the, of the same aha. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, so this, and, and Gary and, um, and uh, Eric Newton came up with three pages of rules for the contest, which I took and I, and I respectfully turned over and I said, I want you to see that I'm turning this over um, in a respectful way that says, I appreciate the work you did, but the answer to all of these rules is no. Because if we have three pages of rules, all we're going to get are variations on themes we've already thought about. The whole purpose of this is to, is to start with a blank slate, which a foundation is privileged to do. I don't have uh, shareholders. I don't even have readers tomorrow waiting for me to deliver a product, a, a newspaper. Um, I don't have anybody waiting on us to do anything. What we are charged to do uh, is, to, is to promote journalism and to do uh, good works in the communities where the Knight Brothers had newspapers. Um, and Jack and Jim were both, Jack and Jim Knight were both explicit that they didn't have a crystal ball. They wanted it to be an evolving interpretation of what that should be, and so I thought, well, then let's go. It's been a, it's been, uh, it's been absolutely transformational uh, to take that approach. Frankly, I think it's a really journalistic approach because it says it goes at the story without, without prejudice. It goes at the story and says, all right. So we used to have that, and now we have this, and and where is it going, and how did it get there, and what's actually happening. And who's got some ideas, and and then you report it. You make sure that a lot of people see it. Be open to comment. Have people tell you you're crazy, as they have. Have people tell you that you're a genius, which I'm not, uh, because they're looking for another grant. Uh, and and uh, and in the and in the and in the interim, I think we're helping uh, a whole group of people, both media people who are interested in information and journalism people who are interested in, re in reaching communities with their journalism coming together uh, in both our journalism department and our media innovation department, working in, in tandem but not any longer together. They are, they're, they really are uh, working in, in different kinds of ways. Media innovation is to explore what crazy things might happen. And journalism, the purpose of our journalism department that Jennifer Preston runs, is to, is to help in that transition to a world where everything is digital. So I'm sure a lot of people would like to know the secret sauce. What does it take to catch your eye for those night challenge um, applications? Truly, there is not a secret sauce. There, there are so many people who are involved um, in the first place, you, you, you say, ask it as if it were me. I am the last resort before going to the trustees of night. But what I get to see is what has already gone through two different sets of readers and our staff. So outside readers, uh, they are wonderful, fantastic, diverse, really smart people from lots of different backgrounds. 
Um, we've had high school students in there, we've had professors in there, and we've had everything in between. Um, we've had people who have nothing to do with the news business, just simply smart people who have to do with, with, with digital media. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they, they respond to the innovation in the idea um, and whether it's, it sort of feels like this could be. And then the staff has to go and make a judgment about whether the person who's proposing the idea is simply clever or clever and able to actually execute. Pull it off, right. Pull it off. Mm -hmm. And then, the, honestly, the grant in, in a way is, uh, is almost the least of it because by the time you get to that stage, um, nobody has had, by the way, nobody has had a lot of investment in this because the, the, the first application is character limited. I just want to know, do you have an idea? And, um, and if it's a really clever idea that, that somebody gets excited about, it goes on to the next phase. By the time it's, by the time we get to the end, it's a pretty exhausting process. But in the beginning, it's just about ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's also very useful because we also invite other foundations uh, to come uh, to come and join us. I'm I'm thrilled to tell you that we've had uh, Robert Wood Johnson at the table. We've had MacArthur at the table. We've had Google involved, um, actually making contributions. Uh, we've had Ford Foundation. We've had OSI at the at the table. Uh, we're working. We're working in collaboration with a number of those foundations, and also Sloan on big data. It's it's so different now than it was seven or eight years ago, uh, with all of these great organizations taking notice. We just were at Ford Foundation last week with a number of those uh, those those groups, and and maybe 150 or 200 grantees of all of ours, and it was an exciting, exciting moment uh, to see what, uh, to see the community of people uh, that we've put together and the, and the cross-pollination between people who are driven by journalism and people who are driven by, by, uh, by media, by the media itself, the code, the program itself, mm -hmm. the science. Of the many Knight grantees, um, can you identify two or three that you think have been game changers? Game changers. <laughs> I don't know that they've been game. I don't know that we've had a, a, a game changer. We've had some that have done really interesting work that have really mattered to me. It mattered to me that we were funding the foundation started by Tim Berners-Lee, who is Gutenberg, who invented the World Wide Web. And the purpose of the foundation is to ensure a free and universal web. That that matters enormously to me. That's like a motherhood and apple pie to somebody who believes in Justice Black's view of the First Amendment that says Congress shall make no law because it's free to speak. You're a citizen. Talk. Um, it it was it was fascinating to me to see something that was called Spot.us that was not particularly successful as a as a business, uh, but was phenomenal as an idea. It was a fellow named named um, David Cohn who mm -hmm. who uh, uh, came up with this uh, with this platform where journalists would pitch a story, and you're not pitching it to an you will have to pitch it to an editor, but first you're pitching it to the crowd. And if the crowd puts up the money, you can then have an editor who would say, yes, I'm willing, or no, I'm not willing uh, to go forward with the story. And there, there were stories that were funded through this. This is before Kickstarter, mm -hmm. um, before Donors Choose, before Kiva. Um, there was a spot that I specifically to try to engage the crowd in what David used to describe as the most fun decision in all journalism. Let's go get them, mm -hmm. um, and it was uh, it was great. Um, and and you know there are lots of other uh, stories I could, uh, lots of other uh, grantees I could. Talk. Document Cloud is something that came out of uh, out of a grant that we made that was a collaboration between ProPublica and the New York Times. The Texas Tribune, which I think is one of the one of the absolute best uh, publications about politics anywhere, and one of the 
handful of organiza online news organizations that are, I think, sustainable today. Mm -hmm. uh, others may be getting there, but they're one. Uh, Voice of San Diego, the same. We currently are funding almost 30 uh, budgets, uh, or partial funding of budgets of uh, online news organizations. I think that's, I think that's actually enormously important to do even if you don't have a specific project that they're working on, until we all figure this out, and we haven't, uh, until we all figure out what, what mobile ultimately means, until we all figure out what engagement ultimately means, and until we all figure out what is, what is responsible journalism um, uh, in the digital age, I think it's really important uh, to have these organizations that are driven uh, by the need to perform journalism, the need to inform community, and with values that we respect and share, they, they, they need to survive. And so if we can do a small part, um, that's important. This is an Alberto Ibarguen quote. If you care about journalism, you have to care about technology. Explain. Look, if you, if you, if Jack Knight didn't care about technology, he would never have figured out that because of something called the telephone, he could go from Akron, Ohio, to Miami, to Charlotte, to Detroit, to Philadelphia, and run a group of newspapers that in his moment was the biggest newspaper company in America, when newspapers were everything in, in, uh, in news. It was the smart attention to what was possible, what was just around the corner, and what to be ready for. And I don't mean just cold type. Jack Knight, in 1948, there's a German magazine talking about this guy, Jack Knight, in the United States, who's talking about one day maybe faxing his newspaper to his, to his readers. 1948. Most of the world didn't know what a fax was. Um, so th this, was, this, this is um, my template. Uh, it's not, I don't channel Jack Knight. I think a lot about him. I've sat in his office now for almost 20 years at the, at the Herald and then at, at the, at the uh, foundation. Um, but it was the smart application of technology for the purpose of informing communities so that people could determine their own interests. Uh, this is, this is the, the small d Democrat of our time. He was a Republican, by the way, but he was a small d Democrat in the sense that he believed in an informed citizenry. So we need to figure out what will people use, how will they use it, and how will they value the information based on how they got it. People react very differently when they see a, a, a documentary than when they read um, essentially the same story, but in print. How will, they, how will they react because they saw it, they read it on a mobile phone or they saw it on an iPad or they've um, heard it on, still on radio or, or, uh, or some version of, uh, of television. Television, I think, is when, when those of us who are newspaper people talk about news, I think we often forget that most Americans are still getting uh, their news primarily from television, and television is an easy meld into internet, as easy mm -hmm. as the written newspaper. Um, so all of that has to be uh, has to be taken into account if you are serious about informing community. If you're serious only about writing for your friends, it doesn't matter. Uh, type it up. You don't need a computer. Just use the old Underwood standard and send it over to your pals. But if you're really serious about reaching the crowd, uh, you've got to pay attention to the technology. And the fact that people were going away is nothing more than, I think, it's, it's, it's part of a, of, a, of a natural wave. There was, there was print newspapers, then there was radio, then there was television, mm -hmm. then there was cable. Let's not forget cable. Um, and people and that, resisted all of those. And people resisted all mm -hmm. of those, every single one of those. I, I think I've, to, I've told you the, my favorite Yogi Berra quote before, uh, which is this. If the fans don't want to come to the ballpark, nobody can stop them. If people are walking away from whatever it was we were offering them, how are you going to stop them? The only way to stop them, I think, is to attract them by continuing to provide a service that's essential, 
and I think we do, and doing it in a way that they're willing to receive it on their terms. It used to be that you didn't have to worry about that because there were no other terms. Um, then came radio, then came TV, then came cable, and now is internet. And now internet is able to permeate in ways none of the others were able yeah. to do. Let's just, let's stop wringing hands and just say, how do we do this? How do we do um, great journalism that informs community and preserves this democratic republic? Just one more question. What advice do you have for a young person considering a career in journalism? I really don't give out a whole lot of advice because um, it's your life, not mine. I'll tell you what's worked for me. What's worked for me is a phenomenal liberal education. Uh, I, I think that taught me how to always keep on learning. That taught me that, that continuing to learn is fun, uh, is interesting. It keeps you, uh, it keeps you engaged. It keeps you, it doesn't mean I agree, gosh. Anybody who ever published a newspaper and says you have to agree with me wasn't paying much attention to what was going on <laughs> into his or her newspaper. Um, I, I think though it's, it's been the greatest gift my parents gave me and Wesleyan University gave me. Uh, it's, that, it's that belief that uh, Victor Butterfield, the president of Wesleyan, told us at, at matriculation, if the, if the four years at Wesleyan are the best years of your life, then Wesleyan failed because the purpose of a great liberal education is to learn how to always keep on learning and know that that's the secret to life. Well, thank you, Alberto. We've been talking today with Alberto Abarguen, the president of the Knight Foundation, and thank you for joining us at the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios here at the National Press Foundation, where we are making good journalists better. <laughs>